thousands of young ambitious graduates dream about a career at top firms in consulting or investment banking every year. And among those, there is one firm that rules them all. Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs is always going to be a competitive place. It's always going to be a place where people work hard and there's lots of reward for that effort. Getting a job at GS promises young graduates power, prestige and wealth early throughout their careers. And it also enables them to work anywhere they want afterwards. Goldman Sachs is the pinnacle of prestige for ambitious finance chimps. But the status and money you can earn at Goldman require a lot of sacrifices to be made. It is famous for its long hours, toxic work culture and MDs hitting you with a nightly please fix at 3 a.m. An analysts are quoted as saying, my body physically hurts all the time and mentally I'm in a really dark place. I've been through foster care and this is arguably worse. If you are facing this type of situation as an entry-level analyst already, you can imagine what it's like for a C-level executive. Nonetheless, young people dream about being a CEO later in life. Only a few make it. And for those that do, it's a tough battle in any company. Even more so in a company that only consists of high performers and absolute overachievers that have been in the top 1% their whole life. Enter David M. Solomon the current chief executive officer at Goldman Sachs, who was able to not only succeed in this hyper-competitive environment, but also defeat his colleagues in a battle of climbing the corporate ladder and coming out as the primus inter pares in a pool full of sharks. David was once an inexperienced baby gorilla. I think it really came from the fact, and it's kind of interesting because I, I, I look at myself and I think about myself and the way you know I'm wired, I was more of a follower. David thrived in the world's most hostile firm and leveraged his starting salary of only $22,500 by 1,555x to more than $35 million, turning into an absolute silverback. In this video, we will find out how he managed to rise from the ground and became the leader of the most prestigious investment bank while allegedly using his influence to DJ at major festivals and causing quite a bit of controversy. Just like a true finance chat, David Michael Solomon was born in 1962 at a young age in Hartsdale, a small suburb of New York, less than 50 kilometers from where he will rule the world in the coming years. David grows up in fortunate middle class conditions, with his father being an executive vice president of a small publishing company and his mother working as an audiology supervisor. Both of them are a great inspiration and motivation to him throughout his career. There are a bunch of things about my motivation and my drive that clearly come from my mom. He visits Edgemont Junior Senior High School. Not exactly a high school you need to know, except for the fact that it is also attended by the guy Greg Lippmann from Deutsche Bank in the big short. Big bank, small bank, I like to make money. His mother wants him to be successful and makes him study hard to become a doctor, ultimately settling for a middle class life in a respected profession. David has no ambition of pursuing a career in the medical field at all, but he has no other plans either. He joins the private Hamilton College in 1980 and chairs the social fraternity Alpha Delta Phi. It's famous for its alumni, including for example John Davison Rockefeller Jr., O.J. Simpson and Theodore Roosevelt. During the summer, he takes his first baby steps in finance by working for Merrill Lynch. Eventually, he earns a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science and government and plans to be a lawyer. But he follows his friends and stumbles into the world of finance. I was here in New York City as a cold caller. And I spent my summer, I had a list, it was a zip code list, and I had to make a hundred cold calls a day off that list to try to get people to open an account at Merrill Lynch. And I did it for eight weeks. So I was making 500 calls a week and I got two meetings and opened one account. And they said that that was highly successful. But you think about, you know, you think about, um, you think about an agonizing summer. I remember, I remember after the first week, 
going home to my father and saying, I can't do this for the summer. And he said to me, yes, you can. You committed to do this. You know, find a way to make it into a game, make it more exciting. And it actually it was a super experience because it actually taught me that you could pick up the phone and call anyone. Mm. And, you know, it became a game to see how long you could keep him on the phone. But it was brutal. At this point, he's still a lost chimp with no idea of what he wants to do. I think it really came from the fact, and it's kind of interesting because I, I, I look at myself and I think about myself and the way, you know, I'm wired. I was more of a follower. But that's going to change soon. Although finance is not as prestigious at the time as it is nowadays, many graduates fresh out of college dream big and want to make it on Wall Street. David is one of them. He is driven by the idea of earning a shit ton of money and living in the capital of capitalism. And so, he approaches the only organization that will be able to live up to his dreams. He applies for a two-year role in Goldman's newly founded analyst program and gets rejected. He decides to go for whatever banking job he can get and joins Irving Trust, a beta commercial bank no one has ever really heard of. Oh. <laughs> they are only paying him 25 grand a year, nowhere near the big boys he wants to be part of. Those numbers up, those are rookie numbers in this racket. But David soon realizes that to set foot in the world of finance, you need to go to a business school and get an MBA, a master in business administration. Nothing you need nowadays, but he decides to follow his friends once again. On a special evening in 1968, David Solomon is approached by the New York-based headhunter Gary Goldstein regarding a potential interview for a job at the investment bank Drexel Burnham Lambert. He talked to me for 20 minutes and he said, I have to introduce you to somebody. Um, and he went and he introduced me to somebody at Drexel Burnham. In the late 1980s, Drexel Burnham is a thriving company selling high-yield bonds. Today, it would probably rank next to bulge bracket banks such as Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs. Back then, Drexel Burnham Lambert was a company that built future giga chats. Famous people such as Leon Black, the co-founder of private equity firm Apollo Global Management, Richard Handler, the current CEO of Jefferies, and many others used to work there in their early careers. After talking to the headhunter for 20 minutes, the matter is settled. David is now on track to become a so-called commercial paper salesman, essentially responsible responsible for selling debt instruments issued by large companies. Every good salesman has two key traits, being patient and having outstanding communication skills. And oh boy, could he sell. After receiving special training and corporate credit, it turns out he is quite good at it and fits the company's aggressive work culture of avaricious bankers just fine. And it just kind of worked and I did very, very well. Early on, David gets the chance to work with the CEO Michael Milken directly and learn from him. Michael himself is a true finance chat, pioneering the bond business and eventually going to jail after pleading guilty to six counts of securities fraud. But that's not all. He had to pay a gigantic $650 million in fines. True Bateman material right there. David learns more than he could have at any other company at that time. Closing deal after deal, working for a major player in the field, everything is going just fine for our aspiring silverback. But it's not going to last for long. Every time greed rises and more people start flooding into a niche, it's eventually going to burst. That's exactly what happened to NFTs since the beginning of 2022. Tech companies during the early 2000s and also the high yield bond market in the late 80s and early 90s. We all know about bonds. You give them to your snot nosed kid when he turns 15. Maybe when he's 30 he makes 100 bucks. Boring. Wall Street doesn't give a fuck about minor returns on their invested capital. That's why they are so-called high-yield bonds. Instead of lending our money to a conservative business that always repays its debt on time and hence only pays low, low yields, we could also give it to a financially insecure developing company or a country and require them to pay a higher yield for receiving our funding. 
Instead of the usual 2 or so percent yield, we can go well above 10, 15 or even 20 percent, depending on how shitty an issuer's credibility is. Hence the name junk bonds. During the 1980s, the market experiences a growth of more than 34% annually, expanding the whole market from a mere 10 billion to a whopping 189 billion by 1989. But eventually, the music stops playing. Michael Milken and other bankers of Drexel Burnham used junk bonds to finance their speculative private equity bets by supplying risky LBOs. That means that they took on a lot of expensive debt to take over other companies, optimized them and then sold them at a higher price. Essentially, they were trying to be a KKR clone. Eventually, the scheme went bust in 1990, causing Drexel to post an operating loss of 40 billion US dollars, the first ever since the company's inception 54 years prior. Milken gets accused of insider trading and racketeering. In 1990, after pleading guilty to lesser charges, he was fined 600 million dollars and had to spend 10 years in prison. In February 1990, Drexel was forced into Chapter 11 bankruptcy to restructure the company. The New York Federal Reserve and the SEC gave them a $650 million fine for three counts of stock parking and another three for stock manipulation. It was the first Wall Street firm to be forced into bankruptcy since the Great Depression, leaving David Solomon right where he's been before, jobless and at the bottom. But David is a smart young guy who knows how to leverage the knowledge gained at previous employers to overcome the challenges ahead and advance to the next level. Boy, I learned a lot of lessons about what can go wrong you know, in a financial services firm. In 1991, he has a short stint at another Wall Street giant, Solomon Brothers, this time as a vice president. Solomon is also where another finance giant gets his polish. Michael Bloomberg, the creator of the infamous Bloomberg Terminal, whom we have also portrayed on this channel. After dominating the business game, Michael will go on to pursue a career in politics, indirectly influencing the course of David's career. But let's get back to Solomon Brothers. But as it turns out, that's yet just another shithole about to implode in the next years because of manipulating US Treasury bonds. Once again, looking for a job, he decides to become the managing director of the bankruptcy and high yield bond group at Bear Stearns. At the time, Bear Stearns is trying to make a name for itself and become the next big Wall Street giant. Which I think is something that, that, that's worth just touching on for a minute because Bear Stearns was, Bear Stearns was a pretty meaningful you know, of a firm like Goldman Sachs, but it was a scrapey firm, but it, it had a good reputation. And it was a true you know, meritocracy. Um, the person that produced or impacted, you know, rose very quickly in that organization. And I, um, I thrive there. It ain't the next Goldman yet, but it's surely trying to achieve that status. Funnily enough, in 2008, Bear Stearns is going to rank in the long list of banks and investment firms that went bankrupt. Uh, and then I wound up at Bear Stearns, no pattern developing. There is a saying on Wall Street by Baron Rothschild to invest when there is blood on the street. Bear Stearns decided to do just that to prepare for large profits in the next market upswing. The savings and loan industry was going out of business, but by 1991-92, you know, all that started reversing and the junk bond business kind of took off and you know, we built a pretty big business at Bear Stearns and by the middle of the 1990s, both of us were on the 10-person management committee at Bear Stearns, and so we were, you know, we were among the top 10 people running the firm. I was, you know, I was in my, I was 33 years old, and so I really thought I was going to stay at Bear Stearns forever, um, and I was certainly, you know, at a very young age in a position where I had a big career there. David rises quickly through the ranks, making co-head of investment banking in 1995, just four years after joining the firm. 
This position once again demands high deal-making skills, a subject David is no stranger to. During his time at Bear Stearns, he oversees many deals, but none is as vital for his future career as the Venetian hotel deal in Las Vegas. Sheldon Adelson, owner of the third largest casino company worldwide, is looking to build a new casino on the strip of the city of Sin. This one is supposed to be modeled after Venice and attract many folks to its buzzing gambling halls. Adelson is an entrepreneur as you would imagine, borrowing $200 from his uncle at the age of 12 to buy the rights to sell newspapers in Boston. Having started countless businesses in his life, he amasses billions upon billions. Fair. Fair as a factor. Completing deals together for multiple years at this point, there is some serious business coming along its way whenever the two men meet. When Adelson is looking to finance his latest project in 1995, David and his team at Bear Stearns already imagine themselves celebrating a huge mega deal of over a billion dollars. But a new competitor is looking to gain a foothold in this field. Goldman Sachs, led by John Winkle Reed, who will later become the co-president of Goldman Sachs. The team of newcomers behaves like hungry wolves chasing after their dinner. Similar to many students and wannabe finance chats nowadays, Adelson admires this Wall Street legend and is excited about the idea of doing business with them. Unfortunately, that means that despite their previous deal history, Sheldon Adelson decides to complete the financing with Goldman. After countless hours of negotiating, David is kicked out of the deal. Despite losing the contract, the aftermath of the deal turns out pretty well for David. You see, there are two ways you usually land a job at one of the top tier companies in this game. Either your dad golfs with an executive of the firm, or you are a networking genius with more LinkedIn contacts than any sane person and spend hundreds of hours preparing for the interview. But for hardworking people like us psychopaths, there exists a third way. Proving your fucking value by working your ass off and consistently delivering results. As a soon-to-be silverback, David falls into the latter category. Remember John Reed? Despite losing the competition for the Venetian Hotel, this fellow gentleman is quite impressed by David's abilities. And at the end of that, uh, John Winkle returned to me and said, you know, you should come to Goldman Sachs. David is shocked. An offer from Goldman Sachs. He has already accomplished more than most others working in finance ever will. But accepting this offer will entitle him to achieve even more, ultimately allowing him to be the CEO of the most prestigious company in the world of investment banking. But accepting it also means stepping down from his current role as co-head of investment banking and going for a lower rank at a new employer. Most people think he is insane for even considering it. And in hindsight, that's easy to kind of think through. At the time, I, I think people called it shocking when you decided to leave Bear Stearns. People at Bear Stearns were shocked. So how I, mean, I was shocked. But David is nothing like the betas around him. Ambitious as he is, he realizes the opportunity that lies ahead of him to truly make it. So he goes for it. Like I said, if I'm gonna do this and this is where my career is going, you know, why not, why not play for the Yankees? David is now all set for one of the brightest careers on Wall Street. Climbing the ranks to eventually become the CEO is the dream of many young ambitious people. Climbing rank by rank, they are promised even more money and prestige than the previous role could offer them. But the further you go, the more devious your colleagues get since everyone wants to get promoted, making it harder to get the myth and shrouded promotion. At Goldman Sachs, you typically start as an analyst and get promoted to associate after about two years. After five to six years, you get the chance to be promoted to vice president or executive director. So far, you pretty much only have to work for the firm long enough and don't do any stupid shit to get promoted. But that changes once you withstand all the pressure and are ready for the next level, becoming a managing director, which is only possible every two years. 
At this point, you really have to start fighting for your next promotion. The firm doesn't need to promote you, that's the truth. There are by far enough candidates to choose from. But if you are considered, you will be subject to extensive review. Your leadership ability, reputation, alignment with the firm's culture, values, but most importantly, your ability to bring in deals to make the company money. If you stand against all odds and make it this far, congrats! But now you will want to try to go even further. This means becoming a Partner Managing Director or PMD, which is just the new term for partner after GS went public in 1999. A selective group of fewer than 100 people are promoted every two years to this level globally. The competition for one of these spots is more than just hostile. A shark tank would be easier to survive in. But if you make it this far, you are rewarded with monetary compensation and deals, easily bringing in multiple million dollars a year. Don't tell my wife this, but being named partner was the greatest day of my life. Because David got recruited by John Winkled Reed, he can skip ahead of all this process and join as co-head of Goldman Sachs high yield and leveraged loan business and become a partner directly. What the fuck? Why is he a partner without doing anything for the firm? Not everybody is happy about the new hire. Imagine being a loyal MD, eyeing after the next promotion, putting work first and hustling for all the years you worked at GS, just to lose your spot in the partner ranks to an outsider you've never heard of? That's exactly what he is viewed as by many in the beginning, an outsider. But David manages to justify his rank and pave his way through many positions over the coming years. Starting as the global head of financing, he is appointed to the management committee in 2004 and gets promoted to co-head of the investment banking division in 2006. His task is to bring in as many clients needing financing as possible. In the prospect of lucrative deals, bankers are willing to do anything to convince a company to become their newest customer. For example, in 2007, the Canadian athletic apparel retailer Lululemon Athletica is looking for banks to finance their initial public offering. Underwriting and IPO can be extremely profitable if there is enough demand for a share. All of the large banks on Wall Street are competing for this one deal. UBS makes 75 of their bankers do yoga in Central Park with clothes by the brand. But Goldman eventually outcompetes them by making their bankers wear Lululemon to their meeting with the board. When David goes there, he's dressed in a maroon blazer and sweatpants, convincing them to complete their IPO with Goldman Sachs. During this time, he starts to pick up DJing after talking to Paul Oakenfold in a bar in Los Angeles. What starts as a hobby during the weekend later turns into a regular habit of DJing at small clubs in the East Village. So far, he manages to stay more or less undercover and just have some fun. After holding his role as co-head of investment banking for over 10 years and patiently waiting for the next promotion, he is elected as the president and co-chief operating officer in January 2017. He even turned down an offer by Sheldon Adelson to become the CEO of the Las Vegas Suns Corporation. David is surely honored, but doesn't want to leave the firm to which he will probably dedicate the rest of his life. Most people would have never gotten as far as he did. Working alongside then-CEO Lloyd Blankfein, many would argue that he's already made it. However, David wants to go after the last bit of prestige, becoming the king of a Wall Street giant. In October 2018, his long-awaited dream is finally coming to reality. But it was a little bit of a surprise. In a typical Lloyd way, it, it was a Thursday afternoon. It was a conference room next to his office, and my office was next to the conference room. And when Lloyd wanted to talk to me, he had a tendency, he'd, he'd basically go, David! And um, you could hear out of his office down the hall into my office, or somebody that was sitting, one of the assistants would say, David Lloyd wants to talk to you. And so, you know, I went waddling down to his office and I walked into his office and he said, you know, I've been working with the board and I've made a decision. 
you're going to be the next person to run Goldman Sachs. I'm going to have a conversation with Harvey. And uh, I don't know exactly what the timing is, but it's soon, not long. Um, but I just want to let you know, you know, you're going to be the next CEO of Goldman Sachs. He made it. After spending more than 15 years at the company, David is finally on top of literally everyone in the world of finance, granting him absolute silverback status. But the story isn't over just yet. And there are some controversies to follow. Like many members of the 0.1% club, David has a fondness for exquisite wine. During his rise through the ranks, he amassed a collection of raw wines worth multiple million dollars. Between 2014 and 2016, the family's then personal assistant stole more than 500 bottles worth more than a million dollars including seven bottles of Domaine de le Romane Conti, which Solomon purchased for more than $130,000. When he and his wife get to know what's going on, they demand the assistant to pay back a portion of the money. Scared after getting caught, the assistant leaves the country and travels around the world until he gets caught after landing in Los Angeles on January 16th, 2018. On the trial day in October, he commits suicide by jumping from the 33rd floor of the Carlisle Hotel, days after David was officially promoted to the president of GS. In the following years, David makes rather significant changes to the company to prepare for the future ahead. The infamous working condition survey leaked in February 2021 describes how first year analysts feel after joining Goldman Sachs. Uh, analysts are quoted as saying, my body physically hurts all the time and mentally I'm in a really dark place. I've been through foster care and this is arguably worse. While David wants to break this traditional banking culture of 100 hour work weeks and strict dress codes, his employees don't seem to have noticed it. I said, go back to work and just enjoy that. You have this moment, you know, in the solar system where, you know, everything everything's working. Up. Just, you know, enjoy the ride a little bit. David is loved by the shareholders, but hated by the workers. In the months the survey is conducted, many top talents leave the bank. Even most of the people he promoted during his time as CEO quit. You could say everything is getting worse since he completed the main game and started to go after side quests, aka building his career as a DJ on the side. In 2018, he started officially publishing a cover of Fleetwood Mac's song Don't Stop under the alias DJ D Soul. He went on to publish 12 more songs in the coming years, four of which got released in 2022. To some, his music career has always been a thorn in the side, but never more so than this year. After appearing at festivals such as Lollapalooza and using the company's private jets to get there, he faces more and more backlash. Some investors and employees are worried he is more concerned with building his private brand than managing the company. Whether those concerns are justified is beyond the scope of this video. Despite all the controversy surrounding him, David is a prime example of how even a chimp at first sight can turn into a silverback if he puts in the work and effort to make it. Starting from humble beginnings, he has proven his value to employers along the way until eventually achieving what most people dream of their whole life. As one of the most legendary salesmen on Wall Street, he has seen and experienced a lot. With a Patrick Bateman-like mindset, he thrived in the most hostile bank you can find anywhere in the world to ultimately become its CEO. We don't know what's coming next, but maybe he's going to quit Goldman to pursue his career as a music producer full-time. Or he follows Michael Bloomberg's example and becomes the mayor of New York, trying to become the president of the United States in the future.